Well, uh, thanks for uh, coming to Grace today. I want to welcome you, welcome everyone at the uh, chapel, everyone in the Chaska campus, and certainly to uh, everyone watching online. Uh, we are in a uh, teaching series, as you know, walking through the uh, New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. So you can go ahead and make your way to chapter 11 today, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You know, uh, when, it, uh, when, it comes, when it comes to God's Word, some, some passages are, are hard to understand, and some passages are hard to accept. Let me say that again. When it comes to God's Word, some passages are really, really hard to understand, and some passages are really, really hard to accept. And I, and I would say that today's text is, is both. 1 Corinthians 11 is, is a beast. It is as complex as it is counter-cultural. And, and yet, what is amazing about this passage is that it actually, it actually bleeds through so many of, uh, of our cultural and, and theological debates today regarding gender, sexuality, uh, men's and, and women's roles. And so before we, before we dive in, I think it's important for me to, to kind of back up to the beginning and to kind of set the table, establish the, the context before we, we dig into the text. You see, when it, when it comes to stances on, on gender, there are three primary categories. And, and I'm just giving you like a thumbnail sketch on these, right? Three primary categories when it, when it comes to a stance on gender. The first is, the first is feminism. Feminism essentially says that, that men, are, men are bad and, and women are good. Men, men do bad things. Women do good things. And so we need to empower women because men have, men have ruined the world and, and only women can, can fix it. Now, I want you to hear me clearly. I am all for empowering women to be all that God wants them to be. But I don't have to run down or demean men in order to do that. The second category is, is chauvinism. Chauvinism essentially says that uh, at its core that, that men, men are better than, than women. Women are, women are stupid, men are smart. And so, and so women should just stay in the kitchen and have lots and lots of, of babies. Now, now, for the record, chauvinism is, is, is repulsive. It, it really is. Like a real man would never demean a, a woman like that. And so I want you to be really, really clear. Like I, I'm not for, I'm not pro-feminist. I am not pro-chauvinist. We are not that as a church either. I hold to a, a third view called complementarianism. That's a big word, and a, you, you'll figure it out here. I'll kind of explain it here. Complementarianism is, is basically this. We see this in the Bible. The Bible clearly teaches that, that men and women are equal in worth, in value, in gifting, in essence, but have, but have different roles. And so to establish this position, the New Testament writers actually grounded their position in the creation account before sin corrupted relationships and, and culture. And so in Genesis 1 and 2, God establishes and, and answers questions about gender and sexuality and sexual identity and, and gender identity. And so in, in Genesis 1, man, the Bible says that man was created first and, and called the head or the representative to, to kind of lead out God's purposes on the earth. And so God literally said, let us, us referring to the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our own image and likeness, let us make them male and female, Genesis 1.27. And so what this means is that men and women are, are absolutely equal because, right, men and women are both image bearers of God, and, and yet they have different roles. And so, and so God established that man is the head and that woman is to be his helper. 
And, and we've talked about this before, and I think Rob Reno has kind of brought this to light previously, and he was here. Because I think some women are here that, and they're like, help her, like, oh, goody, I, I get to be the, the helper. Like, it's a trite, trivial thing. And, and I would say, like, b- before, before you go there, remember the Holy Spirit is also called the helper. So this is actually a, a high calling and not a slight. And so, biblically, the, the idea is this. Since woman was created from the side of man, she shouldn't be out in front like feminists teach, nor should she be behind like chauvinists teach. A, alongside is, is the way to think about the relationship. A complementary relationship. Helper, lover, friend, equal partner in the in the relationship. And so in, in Genesis 2, 22 and 23, here, here's what we read. I just want you to see this. It says, in, in the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last. So at this point, there was no suitable helper partner for man, right? The animal kind like didn't get that done. And And so God created woman so man and woman could be together. Man wouldn't be alone. There's a togetherness. There's a oneness in this. So then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And so it's it's not out in front as feminists teach. It's not way behind as chauvinists teach. It is alongside. Now, now here's, here's where, in my opinion, society has like, like gone off the rails, like gone off the deep end regarding matters of, of gender. And, and I would say this, that culture has got its hooks in a lot of people, uh, including a lot of, of church people in this way. Today, people say that, that gender is rooted in culture. And so if gender is rooted in culture, whatever then that culture now thinks, now believes, now says, becomes the new definition then for gender. So, so in this way, and you've probably heard these terms, in, in this way, right, gender is fluid and, and not fixed. Can't be binary, it's got to be broader. However, the Bible says that, that gender is, is rooted in creation not in culture. Therefore, it's not fluid, but fixed, male and, and female. Now, now here's, here's what culture has done with this. I don't know if you know this or not, but I was doing a little research this week. There are, there are presently 58 gender options that people can now choose from. 58 different gender options that people can now choose from. And you're like, well, why is this? And, you know, I've tried to rack my brain, like, like, like why is this? Well, one, I just think some, some people are just, just confused. And I'm not trying to be harsh. Some people are just confused. Uh, number two, I would say, and, I, and I've seen this, and I'm sure you have too. Some people are hurting uh, because of terrible things that they've, they've gone through in life, sexually speaking. Uh, and so, man, the enemy, I think, attacks in, in that way. Uh, I think some people just 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 hate their gender and are dissatisfied. Uh, others, and I would say this is kind of kind of what the text is saying today when we look at First Corinthians eleven. Others so despise Creator God that they will renounce anything that comes from God, including the male female gender designation. So you need, to, you need to see this, this, this rightly. And so here's what will happen. They'll propose that gender comes from cultural or sociological conditioning. But, but the truth is, I mean, you just think about this logically. The truth is, is that culture, culture didn't create human beings. Like human beings, human beings create culture, right? Human beings, we, we determine culture. Like culture shouldn't be in charge of me. I, I should be in charge then of establishing or, or setting culture. That's, that's why, and Paul's brilliant in this, that's why Paul goes back to the creation account 
where God made us male and female and said it is a very good thing. So in the creation account, there's no feminism, there's no chauvinism, there's no rejecting of gender or roles between male and female. There's, there's complementary harmony. There's an equal partnership where a, a husband leads and a wife comes alongside to help lead like the Holy Spirit. However, the plot clots in, in Genesis 3 as, as sin enters in. So when, when Eve, our first mother, sinned against God, the, the roles in the family reversed as Eve tried to assume leadership and, and headship over Adam. And, and instead of Adam stepping it up, instead of Adam leading out, what does Adam do? He sits idly by, quiet, passive, uh, timid, cowardly, and, and saying nothing. Ultimately, throwing Eve under the bus Blaming Eve, Genesis 3.12, the woman you gave me, God, was a gift a couple days ago, right? The one you gave me, gave me the fruit. Like, I'm off the hook, she's on the hook. Just an FYI, husbands, listen, knowing, knowing what to do and then doing nothing is, is a sin, and I think maybe the greatest sin facing men today, husbands today in culture, is this sin of passivity, of sitting on, sitting on our hands. And, and then I also would say this, throwing your wife under the bus in front of Almighty God, probably not a good plan. And so in Genesis 3, a, a gender war broke out between, between man and woman. So God knew that the wife would look at her husband and say, he doesn't get it. I don't trust him. I'm just going to lead myself. I'm going to make my own decisions. I'm just going to forget about him. He's not that smart anyway. And God knew that the husband would respond by saying, well, she's not very nice to me. She doesn't respect me. So I'm going to yell at her. I'm going to intimidate her. I'm going to hurt her. I'm going to be mean. I'm going to be abusive. Thus began role conflict. So when there was issues regarding gender, thus began role conflict. Now, the, the biggest surprise of all, when you look at this, is that after Adam and Eve sinned, God did what? God came into the garden looking for someone. And who did he come looking for? He came looking for the man. Genesis 3, 9, God cried out, Adam, where are you? Now remember, Adam did not sin first, Eve did. But because God made Adam the head of his family, he made Adam responsible for the condition of his marriage and, and his family. So, so, so please understand, husbands, being the head doesn't make you the big dog. It doesn't make you the kingpin. It doesn't mean you're the chief kahuna, right? Being the head means that you take responsibility even if it's not your fault. Like you take responsibility to help your wife, to bless your wife. You take responsibility to help and bless your kids. And, and, and by the way, you see the exact same thing in, in Romans 5, verses, verses 12 to 21, where because of one man's sin, the whole human race fell. And, and, and so I think the larger point is, is this. God, God puts the burden on, on man. Yes, the woman sinned first, and she's accountable to God. We see that all fleshed out in Genesis 3. But the man is held responsible for leading his family. And so with, with all of this then as an important backdrop, because Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 keeps going back to the creation account, so I wanted you to have kind of the, the basic storyline of the creation account. With all of this as a backdrop, let's stand together and read what might be the most complex passage in all of the New Testament. How many of you are excited about this text today? <laughs> You're like, what are we going to do here today? Can I be honest with you? Can I be honest with you? Okay. I was this close to skipping over this section and then hoping you wouldn't notice. 
I was like, man, I'm hoping these guys, but I, that I knew you would, I knew you would call me out. I knew you would call me out. I, I'll give you an example. So someone emailed me this, this week, this friend of mine emailed me this week. He said, listen, we're going to cover, uh, I saw 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verses 2 to 16. He's like, good luck, you're going to need it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, jeez. So I'm on the hook here. So, so do me a favor, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this and like, like, hang in there. Let me read the whole thing. Don't get mad and run for the exits, especially if you're a female. It's not as bad as you think. It's way better than you think. So, so give me some time here. Give me some time to untangle the knots. Okay? So let's read this. Paul says, now I commend you because you remember me and everything, and you maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of men. So just hold on. Like, don't start going crazy here on that one, all right? (laughs) Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I can explain this, okay? Verse 8. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created from woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. I have, like, I have an idea. I'm not sure it's a good idea as to what that means. I am going to try to implement the saying moving forward whenever I can't figure something out. So I was thinking, like, why aren't you losing weight? Well, it's because of the angels, right? Like, why aren't, you, why aren't your kids helping out around the house? Because of the angels, right? Uh, why does my dog love trash? Because of the angels. I don't know why he loves Because of the angels. I don't know. I don't know. It's funny. When I read it, I was like, because of the angels. Okay. Okay. Verse 11. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made for man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? So you rockers out there, you rock and rollers, just hold on. Don't get crazy here. Verse 15. But if a woman has long hair, it's for her glory. Uh, For her hair is given to her for a covering. Verse 16, if anyone is inclined to be contentious, you want to argue about this, Paul is saying, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. This is the word of the Lord. Even this is the word of the Lord. So you may be seated. Someone said, you know what, not not all, like all the Bible is equally inspired, not all the Bible is equally applicable. (laughs) I kind of get that, but... uh, Give me just a few few moments here to kind of explain some things. And, 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 and here's the deal. Like the, the trouble in chapter 11 is that um, we, we, have, we have the answers, but we don't have the questions. And let me explain what I mean. So if, if you'll recall, 1 Corinthians is a response letter from Paul back to the church at Corinth. So a group of, of people got together in Corinth started to see the church unraveling at the seams, and so they, they penned a letter to Paul, who, once, who started that church, pastored the church, seeking some wisdom and, and counsel and advice. And so they ask a series of questions, and so 1 Corinthians is a, a response letter to those questions. But the trouble in chapter 11 is that we, we have the answers, but we don't have the questions, which means we have to to go back and try and figure out what the questions were from the Corinthians. It, it, it'd be like uh, me and you having an email chain and then you forwarding the seventh email to, to your friend. And they'd be like, like, I, like I, don't, I don't get it. So they would have to infer and, and piece together lots of previous conversations to, to gain understanding. And, 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 and same kind of thing here. 
So, so in verse 2, Paul basically commends them, encourages them, thanks them for actually listening. So it looks like some of his message, messaging to them is finally taking, finally sticking. And, and, and yet he knows that living in Corinth is anything but easy. You, you want to talk about a tough culture to live in. This was a, this was a messy, confusing place, especially in, in this area of, of gender and, and husband and, and wife roles. And then he says in, in verse 3, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Now listen, people, I'll just tell you, like people lose their minds over this verse. I mean, I, I was in a church one time and one person's head spun all the way, they did like a 360, they spun all the way around. Like people, people lose their minds. So, so let, let me explain. What Paul is doing here is he, he's, he's trying to help husbands and wives, and so like, where does, where does a, a husband and wife look to, to find a, a good marriage? Where do, they, where do they go to try to find a, a model relationship that would inform and instruct and help? The answer, and this may surprise you, is the Trinity. One, one God, the Trinity means one, one God, three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So, so God exists in a, a Trinitarian community, not three gods, one God in, in three persons. Now, are the Father, the Son, and the Spirit equal? Yes, right? Do they share the same attributes? Yes. Are, are the Father, the Son, are they each God? Yes. Is there authority within the Trinity? Yes. Is there deference to authority within the Trinity? Absolutely. Do, do they each play different roles? Absolutely, yes. So, so in the Trinity, the Father orchestrates salvation. The Son accomplishes salvation through his life, death, and resurrection. And then the Spirit applies that gift of salvation by awakening us to our sin and pointing us to a Savior. And so there, there is unity and there is deference amidst the role differences and yet complete equality. And so you're like, like, all right, like what's the big deal? What does that have to do with me? What well, has everything to do with you? It has everything to do with me? We were made in the image of God, right? We were made the image and likeness of God, male and female. And so, and so as, as men and women look to the Trinity to see the value of order and role clarity. That's what we do. We, we go to the Trinity, we, we look and see the value of order, and, and then we see the significance then, the importance then, the relevance then of role clarity, which is really what verse 3 is, is all about. So, so Paul lays out the order for role clarity. And, and so he says, Christ is the head over the church. The head of every man is Christ. The head of the wife is her husband. And, and notice this, the head of Christ is, what's it say? The head of Christ is God. Now that's interesting, right? And so, if, as you think about this, in order for there to be role clarity, there needs to be authority, respect for authority, and then submission to authority. So for there to be role clarity, there has to be authority, there has to be respect for authority, then there has to be submission to authority. So, so notice that even Jesus submits to the authority of his Father, the head of Christ is God. So, so, so question then, when Jesus submits to the authority of the Father, is he, is he less than the Father? The answer is no, never, right? So in the same way Paul is saying here that when a wife submits to the authority of her husband, is she less than the husband? A absolutely not. And so, and so for women who, who don't like this, Please realize that Jesus submits to, and for men who are like, I really like this, 
realize you're not God and you submit to Jesus too. And so people ask me all the time, like, so what does that mean? Well, uh, let me give you one, like, example. So what if a husband asks his wife to, to rob a bank? I mean, should, should she do it? Well, absolutely not, right? Submission, submission works as you follow him as he follows the Lord. But I don't even think that's the point. I, I think that the larger point here from verse 3 is not what everyone thinks. I think that the larger point here from verse 3 is that everybody's under authority. Did you notice that? It talks about men, it talks about the church, it talks about, like everybody's under authority. Men are under authority, women are under authority, uh, children are under authority. Like God has placed all of us under authority because authority is good for us. Authority protects us, it, it keeps us accountable, it, it nurtures us, it grows us, it sets us up for success. Like, like, think about this, right? Without authority, without authority in your home, what would your home look like? Chaos. It would look like chaos. Without authority in, in our culture, what would culture look like? Lawlessness, right? And so authority is actually a gift to us. It's a good thing. And so, and so practically this means that the husband is supposed to be an authority not like an authoritarian, but to be an authority like Jesus. Loving, saving, serving, caring for, giving his life for his church as Jesus does his bride. We're supposed to do the same thing. And that women are to be like Jesus insofar as they respect the authority that God has over them provided it's not in contradiction to God. And so then this issue of head coverings is, is, is really about demonstrating submission to authority. So, so for there to be order, right, order in the home, order in the church, there's got to be authority. There was a group of women in particular who didn't want to submit to authority. So look in verse 4. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. And I'll explain all that. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, submit to authority, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair, shave her head, let her cover her head. And so here's what you need to understand. Like in, in that culture, a woman wore her hair up or wore it in or under a scarf to show if she were single, she was saying, I'm showing respect to my dad. If married, I'm going to do this to show respect to my husband. And so obviously some women refused to do this because they didn't want to submit to or be under authority. And so all that basically means is that God is actually calling these wives back to submitting to authority. And, and, and to do so, notice what he does. He, he goes back to the creation account again to explain why submitting to authority is actually the, the way to go. So look in verse 8. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. So, so here's what we know. We looked at this in, in the creation account. We know the first woman came from a man, like, like Eve came from, from Adam. And ever since, ever since that time, what? Man has come from a woman. Now, I, I'm not 100% sure. We talked about verse 10 just a moment ago. I'm not exactly sure what verse 10 means. He says, this is why, that is why, a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Now, let, let me give you my guess. This is a guess, and, and you can disagree. My guess is that Paul is, is using angels as an example of authority for us to, to consider. And so... The issue of do we respect or disrespect, do we, do we honor, do we dishonor God's authority and God's appointed authorities is, is really not something that began with human beings, but actually began with angels. Remember, God created angels before humans, and then the angels were told to obey God. Some did, some didn't. Those who didn't became demons. And so what Paul, what Paul is saying is that for men, women, or children, 
who, who don't want to respect authority, remember some angels tried this nonsense and it didn't go very well. Like one third of the angels were kicked out of, of heaven. So that's what I, I, I think that it, that it means. And so, and so he's saying then, big picture, men and women are equal. We're both image bearers of God. And, and we have assigned roles from God. Uh, so we need role clarity so that there is unity in our homes and our churches, etc. And so we all then need to fall under authority for our roles. And, and then Paul's like, lest you think this is divisive, lest you think this is destructive, Paul actually says otherwise. Look in verse 11. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. I, I would underline not independent. Verse 12 says, for as woman was made for man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. So, so, so Paul's basically saying independence is not a good thing like many of you have been told. Like independence is not all that it's cracked up to be, where it's like a, she has her career, he has his career, she has her religion, he has his religion, she has her bank account, he has his bank account, she's got her friends, he's got his friends, uh, she has her church, he has his church. Well, eventually she's got her, her divorce attorney and he's got his divorce attorney. That's kind of where that all goes, right? Why? Because we aren't supposed to be independent. We're supposed to be interdependent, not feminist, not chauvinist, fighting, competing, but cooperating, complementing, complementarian, working together as, as male and female as one. So, so Sherry and I don't have separate bank accounts. Uh, we, we don't have separate churches. We've always gone to the same church. Uh, lots of reasons there. Uh, we don't have separate theologies. We don't have separate worldviews. We don't have separate parenting plans. We don't have uh, uh, separate ideas or vision, visions for, for our future. We, we are one, right? We are interdependent. We are male, female. And so... She's not out in front, and she's, she's not lagging way behind. She, she comes alongside, and, and we, we, we do life together. We do marriage together. We do leadership together as, as a unit. And, and then finally, in verses 14 to 16, Paul, Paul basically says, if, I, if I'm going to summarize, I think, the, kind of the main idea of 14 to 16, it's that men should be masculine and, and women should be Feminine. So look at verse 14. Does not nature self teach you that if a man wears long hair, it's a disgrace for him? I don't know how nature teaches that, but okay. In verse 15, but if a woman has long hair, it's for her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. And he's like, if you disagree, don't disagree. No one's disagreeing. So it's kind of what he says in 16. So, so, so let me explain this. Does, does it mean that men can't wear long hair because it's a sin? No. Now, I thought about that. Is, is wearing a mullet a sin? <laughs> maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe, because I'm pretty sure Jesus didn't use a curling iron for his mullet. Uh, but maybe. Uh, I, I think what Paul is saying, bigger picture, is this. Be masculine. Be masculine. Don't wear a dress if you're a man. Like, be masculine. Uh, verse 15. So, in case you're a woman here and you're like, great, I have short hair. Like, I'm never coming back to this church ever again. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that short hair is a sin. It just, it just means be feminine. And can you have short hair and be feminine? Absolutely, you can. I, I think the bigger picture is that it's this, be who God created you to be, male, female, right? Male, female, that's, that's fixed in creation. And so I think, though, that I think, because all we hear today, how, how many of you hear lots of conversations about gender? I mean, a lot, right? And I'm telling you, you, you can go back and look it up today. There are at least 58 different options. And I didn't want to list them, like, 
But there are 58 different options that people are doing this and this. And this. I mean, it's just it's the most chaotic thing I, that I've ever seen in my life. And so l- l- let, me, let me give you the heads up. If something is really confusing, you know it's not from God. Amen? God is not the author of confusion, right? He gives clarity. And so, and so here's, here's what I'm going to do. I don't have a whole lot of time here. Uh, I, I want to give you five, five guidelines, and I'm going to go like quickly through this. Five guidelines to take home and to think through today, and then we're going to kind of talk a little bit more about this next weekend, right? So invite all your friends. So I've got some friends coming today for the second service. So I've, been, I've been working on them, and, and so I've been talking to them, inviting them, working on them, and they're like, we're coming to the 1040 service today, and I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> Please come back. Give us another chance. Kind of, kind of that, you know. Please, no. So let me give you five guidelines, right, uh, to take home and think through today. Number one, as God's people, start taking your cues from Scripture, not culture. Please give me an amen on that. Amen. Thank you. Taking your cues from culture is the equivalent of the blind leading the blind. You do not want to be led by culture. Who who, who knows what people are sitting around thinking of? People who oppose God, hate God, hate the Word of God, hate the people of God. You want to take your cues from Scripture, not culture. Let me tell you what I see. I see a lot of people sitting around thinking up all kinds of things, thinking, assuming they're really enlightened people, when in reality, they're they're like a dog chasing his tail. Like you listen to some of the argumentation, you're like, if you would just think through that, you've made this way harder than it has to be, right? So here's what I would say. Get back to the book. Get back to the book. Get back to the book. Take your cues from the Scriptures not culture. Number two, study the Trinity and the creation account for relational direction. There is, and I can't even scratch the surface, but there's so much to learn from our Trinitarian God. Like, you need to ponder this. You need to learn and grow. Look at, look at how each part of the Trinity has a function and a purpose and a role all equal God, not, not God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. You know, God is the, God is the owner. Jesus works for God and the Spirit. No, there, there is, there is, there's complete unity, equality, functionality, and purpose with, within the Trinity. And so here's what people are going to tell you. Everything that I've talked about today, here's what people are going to tell you. It's just a bunch of cultural leftovers you got to leave that mess in, in the first century. I don't think so. And, and here's what I think. I think that there are some teachings in the Bible that should be stuck in the first century. Like I, slavery would be an example of that, right? So there are some Bible truths that are timely, rooted in an, an era, a culture, in history. And then, then there are Bible truths that are timeless. Some are timely, some are time. Less. Here's how we know that these aren't just cultural leftovers. Paul lays it out for us, not just in Ephesus. He goes back to the creation account to say, here's the order that God has established. Pay attention to the order. Don't just write these things off, right? And so I, I think there's just so much for us to learn and to think. And then there's so much freedom uh, and liberation, when we, when we go back to the book, we study the Trinity, we go back to the creation account for, for direction. Uh, number three, this is, like, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, say no to feminism, say no to chauvinism, and say yes to complementarianism. And you can impress your friends that you learned a big word, complementarianism. So here, here's what I would say, feminism, feminism hurts men and women. It hurts men and women. Chauvinism hurts women and men. So think alongside loving and responding and serving like 
Jesus alongside. We're doing this together. We're doing this as one. Number four, see that husbands and wives need each other. Husbands are not better or more valuable than wives. Wives are not better or more valuable than husbands. We're better, the Bible says, as one, right? Like like we need each other. That's how God has designed it, that we would be a one flesh union. So I see Sherry, and I'm like, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. It's a good way to say it, right? When you see your wife, say, bone of my bone, flesh of, like we're tight. We love each other. How many, how many of you, uh, some of you young ones are getting married, man, you need to, you need to pull that, that text into your, your wedding ceremony. Like literally before it gets to the bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, he sees her. Adam literally sees Eve for the first time and is like, wow, like, like, aichi, wow, wow. Like I've never seen anything like that, right? Like kind of that. It's kind of what it means in the Hebrew, aichi, wow, wow. Like, like, she's awesome. And we're together. We're together. Number five, uh, see the blessing of being under authority. We live in a culture that's like, ugh, ugh, I hate authority. I want to see the blessing of being under authority. Everyone is under authority. You're under authority. I'm under authority. Paul said Jesus submits to the authority of the Father. And so we, we need authority. And here's what we know. God is our perfect Father and our ultimate authority. And, and being the perfect father who is our ultimate authority, he would, here's what you need, he would never hurt us. He would never tell us to do something that isn't good for us. He would, he would never call us to something that isn't life-giving to us. He would never do anything that would, that would hinder our lives. He would never do that. And so there are, there are some passages of the Bible that are really difficult to understand. There are some passages of the Bible that are really difficult to accept. And today I hope that you will accept humbly the, the Word of God. And, and let me say this. Uh, if, if you are a woman here and, and you have been and or are getting abused... You need to tell us. You need to let us know. We had yesterday, we hosted a bunch of single mothers in our home. And one of them getting beat on. Didn't want to tell anybody. Didn't want to say anything. And it, it, like, it crushed us. And so we found out, like, we, we, we want to help. It is never right. It's never okay for you to be abused, ever. We don't talk about that stuff in the church. I'm telling you, you need to tell us. And, and we will help you. We'll make sure you get the protection that you need. Uh, some of you... You need to pray. You're like, I got a lot to think about. Man, pray. Come let us pray with you, alongside you. Uh, and some of you today, it's like, you need Jesus. I, I'm not sure any of this is possible, right, without Jesus. And so you need him to save you, and then you need to keep looking to him. How did, how did he do life? How did he respond in life? He, he is our guide for everything. Amen? And so I pray that uh, you'll come back <laughs> next week. Bring friends next week uh, and, and be encouraged that, listen, God loves us and he would never do anything to hurt us. He would. Uh, and, and this is an example where we trust him and we take him at his word. Amen? So God, we thank you for the Bible, for even the hard parts, for the confusing parts. We want to wrestle through your word because we want to hear from you. And so make the book lift to us today. Make the book lift to us. And I pray this in Jesus' name.